Hello and welcome to today's KDP Universities at Home with Tanya Crosby. I'm Trisha, and for the past five years, I've moved around Amazon's books teams learning the business so I can share it with authors. But we're here to talk to Tanya. Tanya Ann Crosby is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of 30 novels. She's featured in People, Romantic Times, and Publisher Weekly. Her work has been translated in eight different foreign languages. Her first novel was published in 1992 by Avon Books, where Tanya was hailed as one of Avon's fastest rising stars. And her fourth book was chosen to launch the company's Avon Romantic Treasures imprint. Tanya started out traditionally publishing about 30 years ago, but is now an independent author and publisher. She relocated to the U.S. from a small seaside Spanish town at the age of four and then set off a lifelong journey to describe the indescribable, harnessing the elusive power of language. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so you came from Spain over to the U.S., I did. I My mother is Spanish. Um, my father was American and they mm -hmm. met while he was stationed in Spain. And um, so they married and we lived there for the first couple years of my life. And um, we came to the States when I was about four years old. And um, I think I told you that, you know, one of the reasons why I, I, I really wanted to write so much was because I, I learned really early the power of words. I remember like mm -hmm. flying in on the plane and getting off and my grandmother picked us up and seeing the lights. And I couldn't, I kept saying in Spanish, you know, many, many lights, many, many lights. My grandmother was saying, what is she saying? I don't know what she's saying. And um, my mother told her. So she taught me my very first English words. And those were many, many lights. And, oh. but I, I realized, at the, at the, I remember, I remember feeling at the time, you know, just this sense of uh, helplessness because I couldn't really communicate what I was trying to say. And mm -hmm. I, I realized the power of words right that in that moment. And then you were able to translate it into an amazing career. Now, you started traditionally publishing um, a long time ago, but then switched to indie publishing. Why did you make that change? Well, you know, I don't think it was actually a change that I made uh, uh, intentionally. You know, I, mm -hmm. I start. I I loved what I was doing. I value that that uh, period in my career. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I I I wrote, I wrote. I think my first fifteen, sixteen books traditionally, and mm -hmm. burnt out. I just I just I I reached a point where there was no more joy in the writing process for me, mm -hmm. and you know, I just. It burned out, so I took a, a ten-year hiatus from 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 writing, um, mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. You know, life happens, divorce, right. well, all all sorts of things. Um, you know, and during that time, I went to work for a short while at Match.com <laughs> as the their senior writer, and for a little while, I was the editorial director at a stable of five magazines. So I, I learned a lot of really kind of amazing uh, skills at these companies. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to writing, I still thought that I had to sell my first books to New York. And I did. Mm -hmm. um, but that turned out to be a really um, unsatisfactory uh, uh, experience for me. And all of my friends were indie publishing and they were like, you know, you should do it. So I did. And, you know, I found out that I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved being in control. Even if you, you know, fail, you fail on your own, on your own, uh, you know, on your own mistakes or, you know, you can't point the finger at anyone else. But your successes are also all the more exciting and more uh, satisfying as well. Mm hmm. So how much of a learning curve was there to move over to indie publishing? Because with indie publishing, you do everything yourself. So I'm a control freak. <laughs> I, I, um, it, it, you know, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't, there was not for me personally, there wasn't much of a learning curve because, okay. you know, I, uh, I, you know, I learned how to do, uh, you know, I can, I can actually, I, you know, do 
MS DOS and um, and you know back when there was actually no interface. You know, I can right. I I know these things. You know, and I know HTML and that it just mm -hmm. wasn't a pro you know it wasn't a problem for me. Um, and okay. between those that that and the skills that I learned at Match.com and the skills that I learned at the editorial at the magazines. You know, I ended up mm -hmm. just really very prepared for what I'm doing now. And it was very easy. It was both, you know, um, indie publishing is both really difficult and it is also extremely easy. You know, mm -hmm. difficult in the sense that um, you still have to do all the hard work. You have to wear all the different hats. You have to wear, you have mm -hmm. to be the marketer. You have to be, you have to be the writer, which is the most important part. You know, if you can't, if you don't write a good book, then, you know, you don't have, you don't have, um, a career, <laughs> but um, and but beyond that, you also have to know how, you know you have to be a social media expert. You have to be a marketing expert. You have to you know for, do the formatting. You have to you know there's a lot of hats you have to wear. Um, but mm -hmm. in the at the very end of it all, you know it's just a push of a button. You just literally right. upload it and click a button, <laughs> and then you're online. It's that easy. It's that hard, and it's that easy. So let's talk about some of those difficult things that you just mentioned, some of the marketing aspects. Um, when you started marketing your own books, what did you find was successful for you? You know, in the beginning, I was extremely, um, uh, you know, I'm just being completely honest here. But in, mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was, uh, I don't know if it was because I came from tra traditional, pu traditional publishing um, and I already had a bit of a following, but in the very beginning, I was actually very shocked because, you know, I was, um, it was very easy for me. I put my books up mm -hmm. and I had a very welcoming audience for my mm -hmm. books. They just really embraced me and um, I did, you know, really well in the beginning. These days, it's not quite so simple because the competition is fierce. And, you know, it's I've seen I've seen really popular, amazing writers go from being extremely popular on uh, in this new day and age to basically uh, vanishing within six months if they're not doing the work. So you have to actually mm -hmm. it's not it's just not as simple anymore as it used to be in the beginning, you know put a book up for me, it was just put a book up and uh, and my audience was there. Now that's not quite so much the case. So now, um, given the competition, what are the two main marketing levers that work best for you? Uh, so for me, you know, I, I, I tried being wide for a while and I actually do mm -hmm. have to have some of my books wide, but very few of them because I really find that, uh, you know, and I did the, I did the Facebook ads. I did, you know, the um, Twitter ads I've done, and I still do them. I do all of these. Um, but I, I find that one of the, one of the uh, principles that I learned while at Match was that, you know, the fewer clicks, the better. And, you know, you really want to market to people where they're buying the books. You know, so um, Amazon gives us the opportunity through AMS ads to actually do that. So I mm -hmm. chose to go back into KU uh, for that reason. And I take my mm -hmm. authors into KU at least to begin with for that very reason, because, you know, I'm marketing to the I'm marketing to readers where they are. Good. And for those of us who are, have joined us, um, KU is Kindle Unlimited. So the the author facing part of that is KDP Select. So if you enroll in KDP Select, then the readers have the access through Kindle Unlimited to read your books. And to your point, it's a great way to get a new audience and, and reach that new audience. And then boosting it, you choose to boost it with AMS ads. So let's talk a little bit about your ads strategy, uh, because for new authors, uh, the feedback that we get is that can be challenging to figure out a strategy to use for um, Amazon advertising. You know, it, it 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 is, and I think that I probably now there I did probably encounter one heck of a a learning curve because it's not you know I mean I I get all the principles I get the concepts you know um but uh, every single book is completely different and that's you know I, I I'm asked so often you know how do I what do I what do I do to get started and you know the truth is that there's no way around doing the work 
for yourself because every book even within my own list i have you know i have books that um do better than others and i have i have a, a pretty big list at this point not as big as some um mm -hmm. but big enough and um within that within that list you know one series will do better than the other one book will it, within the series will do better than the rest of them and sometimes it's not always the most obvious one so mm -hmm. um so the biggest piece of advice that i think i would give to someone who is coming into this new is that don't try to first of all boost the book that isn't getting the love try boosting the book that you actually are doing best on because that one will uh you know amp Amazon rewards, uh, you know, books that are moving. And so if that particular book has already got the attention of, uh, you know, of your of your uh, readership, then, um, you know, it's already moving and Amazon's going to recognize that. And, um, you know, uh, it's it's that ad will do better than an ad for a book that just, you know, never has done well and is sitting at, you know, 500,000 in the store, you know? So um, I would say start with that first. And then the other thing is, you know, um, you know, it's great to, you know, to be, to join uh, uh, Facebook groups that talk about marketing. It's great to like take advice from other people, but you have to really kind of do the research yourself. I, I would start with, I have two, uh, two books that, um, that I, I recommend, and um, one of them is Amazon Ads Unleashed, and the other one is, um, I can't remember the title, but one's from by, by Brian Meeks, and I think I sent you both of those. You did, um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it has been a while since I've read them because I don't actually refer to them on a, on a regular uh, basis anymore because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I even the advice that I got from those books is far removed from, you know, everyday practice with my own books. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I would start with low bids to start off with. Um, although I know there are several different schools of thought there, but start start with a low bid um, for the book that's doing the best, you know, $5 a day. Um, and then when Amazon says to increase it because it's doing well, increase it. Because, um, you know, even if it doesn't, uh, you know, look like immediately that it's uh, gaining you buys, you know, there's a delayed reporting. and Two weeks down the line, three weeks down the line, you'll see that there there is movement. And on top of that, depending on which platform you're you're using, uh, you know, it's not really taking into account. I think I think KDP now, um, mm -hmm. you know, the KDT, KDP at advertising will now tell you a, a pay, you know, incorporate page reads. But I don't know that it actually. Um, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know if it actually incorporates that into the dollars earned. Okay, but I that's know a that good call. Out. Yeah, so so it's working. If it, if it's if they tell you to increase it, increase it. It's because it's showing. <laughs> the ad's showing. Right. It's yeah. The books are moving. People are responding uh -huh. to it. Okay, and I put the link to uh, the books that Tanya just mentioned into the chat, so the everyone should have access to those books. Um, now, following up, the other question that we get a lot about ads is keywords. You know, how do you choose keywords? Do you start with the default and then let it pick for you? Or how do you, how do you choose those effective keywords? So in the beginning, um, I did that. You know, I let Amazon choose for me. I did the automatic ads and I let Amazon, you know, I mean, who knows better than Amazon who to show their, because, you know, Amazon doesn't make any money unless uh -huh. you're making money and unless your book is being, you know, it's be, unless somebody is buying your book. So I let them choose in the beginning. And then, um, you know, I did the work I, on I, every Monday. I pull down my reports and I go through the, um, uh, I don't really mess with any of the reports except for the uh, keyword search terms. Um, mm -hmm. But every Monday I pull down every, you know, for the last seven days, like actually I do it for 30 days, but I do it every Monday, mm -hmm. um, every seven days, but I, I will pull down re the report for 30 days. And, um, and so what I do at that point is I will um, uh, filter out all of the uh, keywords that didn't get any responses. And I will, uh, 
pull aside the ones that do, and then I will incorporate those into new ads, new manual ads that mm -hmm. incorporate those keywords. Um, so that's that's one method. But the other thing is that you know I you know I'm also like if I, if Amazon has a new if there's a new ad type available to me, I, I'm immediately on it because um, I'm just constantly testing. Some some just do better than others. Um, and those were actually for sponsored ads. But, um, but mm -hmm. you know, so you can't really do the, uh, the I don't know that if there is an automatic option for the sponsored brands ads, which is a whole different type of one. But I right. would recommend trying them all because they all work in different ways. So how They're long do you how long do you leave an ad so that you can test whether or not it's it's effective? So my ads are con I, I never really turn an ad off unless I I might turn a keyword off, but mm -hmm. I never turn an ad off. Like I keep my ads running all the time and I'm I I monitor those keywords. And I also uh uh, use a service now at this point and only because at this in this I don't recommend this for everybody because I just don't feel like it's necessarily on a necessary on a on a um, on an individual basis but I actually use a, a service uh, called ad badger um, because I'm running ads for myself and 20 other authors and so I, I kind of need help knowing when those mm -hmm. keywords need to be turned off or whether you know or or uh, you know throwing in a negative keyword or just you know, I need help with that. So this mm -hmm. service actually monitors those keywords 24 seven and it will, mm -hmm. it won't, it still won't do the work for you. You actually still have to do the work. You have to call the keywords, you have to do the research. Um, but you know, when you, once you, the ad is already up, it will monitor your keywords and it will like um, raise your bid if necessary and lower it so that you're not spending too much. And it mm -hmm. will also turn um, off uh, uh, words or it won't turn them off. It will just make them negative keywords if they're getting uh, too many uh, clicks without any any buys. So I use and I think that, that to help me monitor it. I think that that's a, a really good tip is when you realize that there is a keyword that's getting a lot of action, but that's not translating into sales, turning it into a negative keyword so that it doesn't work with that ad. I think that that's a great call out. Right, you know, because you'll spend a lot of money on, you know, on uh, on just irrelevant uh, searches that have absolutely nothing to do with your book. And, you know, mm -hmm. and truthfully, you know, even if you're in KU, for example, I mean, you don't necessarily want to have uh, Kindle Unlimited as one of your keywords because, you know, it's going to show to a lot of people, but they're, you know, that audience is not very defined whatsoever. It's, um, you mm -hmm. know, if, there, if that's if that's the keyword that, that is uh, that's. Uh, where your book is popping up well you you know it's just it's not it's not targeted at all i mean mm -hmm. you're you're competing with millions of other titles and that's just not really a a, a valuable keyword for you okay now the other marketing tool that you use and you talk about is your newsletter so can you talk us through kind of how you built that what's your cadence what does that look like so uh, yeah, so I I started very early, um, uh, just uh, you know I, I doing various things. I either do will do contest, you know, to have people, um, you know, and that's part of the you know the um, the requirement is that they have to actually join the newsletter, or I will do uh, you know um, just contest giveaways reader magnets, I've done everything. So, um, you know, I've built a pretty substantial newsletter at this point. And, uh, and I always like the, I don't, I don't use it um, indiscriminately because it is, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, people get too many emails these days and yeah. they are very quick to unsubscribe. Um, so I tend not to be one of those authors who uh, do newsletter swaps or, um, and I've actually asked my readership, um, if they would like to see recommendations for other authors that I read um, and enjoy. And their answer to me was no. <laughs> they did not want to see that. They were on my newsletter to get news from me. And so I've respected that. Um, and not to say that that doesn't work for other people, because it does. It's just my subscribers don't want that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very, uh, I'm very, I send those out sparingly. But anytime I ever send out my newsletter, I, you see a bump in sales because 
um, these people are, are there to, you know, to get news from me. And if I have a new release, and I'll, and I'll generally generally send, I try to send them send one out once a month, but don't don't always do that either. However, you mm -hmm. should try to send something out once a month because eventually people forget that they're on your newsletter. And you, you if you wait six months and they get a newsletter from you, they'll go, "How did I get on this?" <laughs> you know. Right. So. <laughs> so. So what be kind? Of Go ahead. So what kind of information do you include? You, you mentioned that you always see a bump afterwards. What kind of information do you include every month? So I'm a, I'm I'm really one of those people that is just you know I have such a hard time tooting my own horn like I really really do and I tend uh -huh. like I I tend to be very very straightforward I don't really I don't do a lot of uh, uh, sales or marketing in in my newsletters I might tell them maybe a, I mean I'm pretty private too so I might actually mm -hmm. kind of share one private thing like you know I might tell them that I you know traveled for research or something like that but Overall, I'm really just being very straightforward in my newsletters and I tell them there's a new release or there's a contest. And I tend to like I have this like it built in sort of uh, I don't know what it is. This the, uh, maybe it's a confidence issue still after all these years. You know, I feel like nobody wants to hear from me unless I'm giving them something. So I, um, you know, I tend not to send out a newsletter unless I actually have a giveaway or a book to give them free or mm -hmm. something, you know, um, and my readers tell me that I'm really generous. So maybe I overdo it. I don't know. But, uh, you know, but I that, that's what I do. OK. Now, you don't, we've heard from a lot of authors that the key to their success is that they publish rapidly. You don't publish that often. Can you talk a little bit about the cadence of how often you publish? Yeah, so um, the most I've ever published when I was with Trad and even Indy, um, you know, is maybe two and a half books a year. Mm -hmm. But I'm more comfortable with one and a half. <laughs> so um, I just don't, I'm not a, I, I am actually, I can be a fast writer. If I know exactly what I'm writing, um, I can I can write, you know, 5,000 words a day. I've written as much as 20,000, which is like really a lot, <laughs> you know, but that was like way back in the day, beginning of my career, on deadline, writing in the bathroom on the floor, you know, that sort of thing, you know, but, um, but these days I tend to be really, really generous with myself. I give myself a 500 word count a day um, quota. I'm very, very, mm -hmm. very easy on myself, like very. And what I end up finding is that, um, and I don't let my, but I, this is the this is the key though. I don't let myself get up until that 500 words is is finished. I just won't like it's. There's no if ands or buts. You know mm -hmm. that. That's what, and, and I, if I'm still there at 10 o'clock at night and I have minus, you know, 300 words, okay, maybe I'll give myself a break. But generally, I do not get up from that chair unless I have 500 words or more. And so what I end up finding is that a lot of days when I get into the groove, you know, I walk away with, you know, 2,000 words. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think people used to, they, in the beginning, people would say, you're so prolific. And I'd be like, I, you have no idea. I am not. But the truth is that if you give yourself 500 words a day and you sit there and you do those 500 words a day by, you know, the end of what is whatever it is, three months, four months, you know, you've got a book, you know. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take that long to write it if you're doing the work. Okay. So um, does... So uh -huh. were, you, were you actually asking advertising wise and, you know, as far as keeping my books relevant, is that what you were, where you're going for more? That's exactly where I'm going with it. So right. how do you keep so, that backlist? Because other authors are like, this is how they make the money. So right. let's talk about that. So I have lots of author friends who are, who, who do um, mm -hmm. rapid release. And uh, I have some writers that write for me that actually do rapid release and it works really well for them. It's a, it's a valid um, uh, marketing tool. But mm -hmm. uh, for me, um, you know, I just don't, I have to have lots of time to uh, sort of let a story percolate before I can actually uh, move forward with it. So I just have built that in. And plus a couple of years ago, I had this like health scare and mm -hmm. I sort of, instead of, instead of uh, writing more, I sort of dug in my heels and decided I need to see if I can stay relevant with no books a year. <laughs> so instead of, I actually, dur that during that entire year, I focused on doing translations. I, that mm -hmm. was my year to do, to sort of 
research and get, dive into translations. And and what I discovered is that if I actually put the um, the dollars into my backlist, the backlist is actually where our money is. It's not really. I mean, you might make a a, a nice chunk on release day or release month for a new book, but it's your backlist that is uh, that is going to make you the money. And it mm -hmm. for me, my best selling book is still a book that is 25 years old <laughs> you know so the mckinnon's bride is that it's the book that is like you know it's my energy energizer bunny it just keeps going and going and going and i have <laughs> other books i'm way more proud of at this point you know that i've uh -huh. put you know I've, I've i think i've grown as a writer since then but um that book still like outsells even those so mm -hmm. um so that that's both yeah. great and frustrating at the same time <laughs> So let's go back and talk a little bit about the translation. I think that that's something that other people find challenging and, and a little daunting. Um, so can we talk a little bit about what your process is and also is how easy you feel that the process is now? So it's it's it is it's a very um, I mean I I can see where it would be daunting. It would be it was daunting to me in the very beginning. Um, but not probably not for the same reasons that it was for most people. I mean, I, as I said, I, I'm I Spanish was my first language and I grew up. My mother's friends were Italian and French and German. And, you know, I had, you know, we had a very multicultural sort of, uh, you know, household and with, you know, all my parents, friends, you know, between my dad being the Navy and my mother being Spanish, we just didn't have that's what we that's those were our friends you know right. so um so i all, i felt like i had a uh, a really great base of um people that i could actually re, you know i i could vet new or or submissions you know to mm -hmm. and um they would they could help me to determine whether the translations were good and mm -hmm. you know but i all, but i do need to say if you do have that kind of a great uh support system you you can't really call upon them without paying them for it because everybody should be paid for their services but mm -hmm. you know i i felt like that was a um it was i had people i had a support system in place um mm -hmm. but these days we're there you know we reach readers you know all across the globe so chances are that within your new on your newsletter or within your readers group you probably have native um uh native speakers, German speakers, or Spanish speakers, or whatever, and mm -hmm. you just put a call out to them to help you to vet these, uh, you know, these submissions, and then you do the work and find the translators, and um, you can find them any number of places, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just any, any number mm -hmm. of places. I mean, I don't know if you want me to mention them but here, but it's, uh, okay. um, you, you just have to do the work, and, mm -hmm. um, and and um, it's it, but publishing them is you know actually finding them, getting the um, the 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 translation is the hard part, getting them published. And it's funny because one of the things that stops a lot of people, and I get this question all the time, is you know where do I distribute it if I do get it? I don't would even know what to do with it. Well, you distribute exactly the same place that you would distribute any English speak any any English book. Um, mm -hmm. KDP, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not even a different, you don't even have to log in to KDP uh, Germany. It's just KDP. You upload it all in the same place. You can now access um, ads for all of the different markets all in the same place. So that's the easy part mm -hmm. of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to your point, you just upload, hit mm -hmm. publish, do the same thing you do for all the, the English content. And we, we get global audience here. So to your point, you know, the world just keeps getting smaller and smaller and people right. have access to all sorts of things. Um, so the advertising that you do for your other languages, same same thing that you do for English? Same, same thing. The only difference here is that you really have to heavily rely on Amazon for the keywords because, you know, I mean, I have some some translators who do help me with keywords. Uh, 
for you know um, especially for the initial upload in in the um, KDP dashboard dashboard they will give me the initial keywords there but mm -hmm. really when it comes to like you know um, your competition or other products to target or whatever you really have to kind of rely pretty heavily on on Amazon on sponsored on sponsored ads um, the automatic sponsored ads because um, I'm not going to know better than Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I, I right. let Amazon do it. <laughs> I think the other thing that um, is daunting for individuals when they're doing localization is the fact that it's not a straight one-to-one -one translation. Like you can't just stick it through Google Translate and have a book. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that process? Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I did early on that I uh, it, it's so important to actually find not only someone who's not going to use Google to just uh, uh, translate your book, which you know can end up being just a bunch of gibberish, uh, mm -hmm. but it's important to also find a translator who's going to really sort of uh, incorporate the spirit of your book as well. Because one of the things that I found, one of the mistakes that I made early on was I had one translator that I worked with, and she was actually a perfectly great translator. She was, you know, well respected, and you know, the difference between her writing style and my writing style was that she actually was very focused on writing erotica, which my stuff is not erotica, and mm -hmm. so she was very, very clinical. And not, I, that's not really even the word. She was very gritty. <laughs> she was very gritty um, in how she described, you know, the love scenes and the, you know, the um, the coming together of the uh, hero and heroine, you know. And so I started to get a lot of, uh, so because one of the things that doesn't change is, is uh, I while there might be slight differences between um, how, you know, Italian romance versus uh, American romance, I think in, mm -hmm. Overall, in spirit, they're not that different. It's not going to be hardcore porn, you know, or yeah. erotica or whatever, you know. So you have to find somebody who's going to really translate the spirit of your work. And because um, I got tons of uh, horrible reviews uh, initially for that book saying, you know, my God, you know, she didn't have to use that those words for this, you know, otherwise it's a really great book, but you know, why did you have to describe it that way, <laughs> you know? So you have to be careful about that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah. So, and the other thing is having Spanish is being Spanish is my first language. And mm -hmm. I thought that Spanish would be the easiest language for me to do because of that. And as it turned out, uh, you know, not only, first of all, do you have to deal with, you know, the, um, European Spanish dialects versus the South American dialects, that, that, which is, it's a real thing. And mm -hmm. I always thought that the, um, the French, the you know the the um, you know the, the French versus Canadian, French Canadian would be the bigger issue, but no, I I have discovered that the Spanish readers are they can be really vicious <laughs> if you use yeah. the wrong um, the wrong if if they're wanting Castilian and I think they're you're safer doing Castilian Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. Then you are going with the South American Spanish because I think that South American Spanish are way the South Americans must be much more forgiving, um, mm -hmm. and maybe accustomed to having that more formal um, language, you know, to read. Mm -hmm. But I found it's the other, not the other way around. Like the, you know, the um, Sp Spanish people from Spain are like way less forgiving of a book that is written in the South American dialect and. Mm -hmm. I would uh, read a, a, a something that came in, in in a South American dialect, and, and I would I you know I'd read it and I understood it just perfectly, and I thought, oh, this is great, you know, and I would put it up and no. <laughs> so yeah, to your point, there's there are global languages that are acceptable and people will be okay with that. There's also colloquialisms that we don't realize that g get into our writing, and those don't trout those don't translate. Um, globally. I think that was the the hardest when I started doing things like this is realizing that just my normal language, not everybody in the world uses that. So I had to change that. And I think it's the same for translations. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there my husband's actually learning um uh Spanish right now and so often he will he'll he'll he's learning these colloquialisms and mm -hmm. um you know, and he'll ask me to translate them before, like, and, and I can't because, you know, um, 
they're so literal. If if if, the, if, the, if you translate it literally, then mm -hmm. um, it's completely wrong, you know. And so he has to wait for them to tell him what they mean. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Taken out of context, it's like right. yeah, that that doesn't make sense to me. Right. right. All right. We've gotten lots of questions coming in, so uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and take some of these questions. Sure. Let's see. Um, okay. So your mailing list, let's go back and talk to you about your mailing list for just a second. How do you make sure that you keep it relevant? Do you go back through and vet the mailing list on a regular basis or you just let other people, you just let them unsubscribe as they want to? So I make it very easy for them to unsubscribe, but I made a really horrible mistake. Um, and I think we learn more, I, you know, I, I say mistake, but I actually feel like um, we learn as much from our mistakes as we do from our successes. So, um, you know, this, this is the thing I won't do again. <laughs> but early on, I, um, you know, I, hear, I keep hearing um, of people, about people calling their mailing list. And I wanted to also do this because obviously there's a cost factor involved you know when mm -hmm. you're sending out um a newsletter to you know 45,000 people versus 20,000 people versus you know 10 you know there's a cost factor mm -hmm. involved but one of the things that i found out too late after i'd already called about 20,000 people from my list one time was that um you know people are reading their emails in so, on so many different formats uh that you know, the reporting software that tells you that something has not been opened is not always correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, I no longer call my list. And um, luckily, I'm actually with a program right now, um, a, a, a service that is uh, the same price no matter how many your uh, how many um, people are on your list. So um, so mm -hmm. that's great. I found them and that they're they're just wonderful. Um, but you know so it's it's i think it's worth paying the extra even if you don't have a service like that you know you, it's worth mm -hmm. paying the extra money to keep those people on your list and mm -hmm. let them subscribe on your own but you know if you a better thing to do is to maybe pull them aside on on mm -hmm. onto another um you know a, a, just a, a a different uh group and maybe don't send all your emails to the entire group, you know, you send them, send them to the people that are responding the most and open mm -hmm. are, are opening your email, but maybe when you have big news, send it to the entire audience. Okay. That's not gonna really cut your cost factor because you're uh -huh. going to be charged um, based on how, how big your list is, but it, it could keep, um, help, it, it's a way to, to keep everybody happy. Mm -hmm. So my question, you have a global audience, is your mailing list for your EN audience only, or do you lo do you localize your your mailing list and have mm -hmm. you know different languages for that? I don't, and I actually in the beginning started out doing uh, Facebook pages for all the different all all the different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I I quickly learned that that was to for me a little disingenuous because I couldn't respond on all those pages in the way that I do on my American page. And these days, mm -hmm. you know, even though you don't want a book written in a tra in, by translation software, so many, I mean, you you can get a, a browser uh, 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 a application for, you know, Chrome or whatever, you know, that will actually translate every page you ever go to. So no, I feel like um, there, there are too many, there are lots of ways for them to communicate mm -hmm. with me on my page, on my terms, in my mm -hmm. own voice. Um, and I prefer that. Okay. Um, let's see. So we've got a couple questions. We've got three or four questions asking if you went back and started over and there was traditional publishing and indie publishing when you started, would you still have gone the traditional route and then moved over to indie, or would you start with indie? I am very grateful for my trad publishing. Now, I, was I always happy there? No. In fact, I mm -hmm. took it. The reason why I took that ten-year ten hiatus was because I became very sort of dis, um, disillusioned with uh, traditional publishing, and mm -hmm. lots of promises were made that were not kept. And I was very unhappy toward the end. And it really affected my writing and my 
my, you know, my, my muse in general and just my joy. Um, and so I had to step away from that in order to realize, in order to get it back into, but, but mm -hmm. I will say, I don't think I would change anything because, mm -hmm. uh, I, there are lots of valuable lessons that I learned in traditional publishing that I apply to indie publishing right now. Now I'm, if both choices were available to me, um, uh, at the same time, as it is right now for most people, I think I probably would have jumped ship sooner. <laughs> like I probably would have stuck through it for 16 votes. I would have learned okay. my lessons and then failed. Moved on. Yeah. Although I so, do say, I will say that a tra traditional publishing is still, a, you know, it, it's still a viable uh, path for lots of people. And there are some books that I still seek to, um, to uh, traditionally publish, like my women's mm -hmm. fiction. I think that's really difficult for, for um, an indie uh, publisher to, to, to tackle. Not impossible, but it's, it's um, especially if it has a more literary bent. So, you know, okay. there, are definitely, there are definitely relationships, good relationships to still be sought there. Mm -hmm. So we have a question about um, British English versus American English. Um, is that something that you consider when you're writing? Because you write historical romances. I, among lots of other things, but yes. Right. Um, you know, I, I tend to like. I, I don't know if it's because um, I have a really good ear. Because you know, obviously, when I first Spanish was my first language, as I said, mm -hmm. this is not. My, I had an accent, you know, and I think that I, you know, wherever I've moved, I've sort of picked up that accent, you know, and I kind of, you know, if I'm watching something, it's, it's funny because I wrote a book, um, uh, one of my, it was a, set, a book set in um, South Dakota, and I, my, my dad was from South Dakota, but I had never really been there, um, and I, somebody wrote me and said, did you grow up there? Because you just picked up all the like, um, you know, all the different sort of colloquialisms and the, you know, the the voice. And, and no, I think I just kind of, especially, you know, and I, but I do write my um, historicals with a, a very different voice than I write my, my contemporaries. It's a very formal voice and it just sort of, mm -hmm. and I'm sure I get it wrong sometimes. I'm sure that, you know, because there are very distinct differences between Eng um, British English and American English. I'm sure that sometimes mm -hmm. I get that wrong. But mm -hmm. um, I haven't really been bopped over the head with that. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have beta readers that, that help you with that um, after you edit and everything like that? Do you have a set of beta readers that you work with? No, you know, I don't use beta readers. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a review team and my, but my, by that, by the time things go to my review team, it has already been through uh, three levels of editors. So no, I don't really use a beta team in that way because once it gets to the, the you know, the beta, um, the beta team or the reviewers, it is, that's that's and I mean if they if they come to me and they they have something a concern that is uh, you know that is that everybody missed somehow you know I I right. will incorporate that if possible but generally that's not what I'm asking them to do when they're reading my books. Mm -hmm. What are you asking them to do? The review team. Really, the review team only has I mean their only duty is to um, if they download a book. They have to agree to do an honest review, and you know, whether that's good or bad, you know that's that that's it. You know, I mm -hmm. um, I only ask that they leave a review before um, asking for before taking another book from me. But aside from mm -hmm. you know just leaving an honest review, that's really all I ask from them. That's what, that's what they are. How big is that team? I mean, and and how did you develop that relationship with them? Well, so before I started the publishing house, that team was probably more, um, it, there were probably around 50, 60 people on it. Um, now I've changed the way that I do with the reviews and I still have my my sort of, my, my own personal team, but a lot of those overlap with the publishing house team as well. And that team is actually, like, there. I think there are like 300 people on that team now. Okay. Um, but they're, they get an opportunity to to read every book that that you know the publishing company um, publishes, but the system I have in place basically sort of 
um, doesn't allow them to take another book until they have left a review. And it can be anywhere. It's just that they have mm -hmm. to leave a review. So it's it's now a pretty large team. Okay. Um, we have a question about Kindle um, KDP Select. Uh, so we mentioned it briefly, we just kind of moved on and we've got some questions about a little more information. Um, and you mentioned that you don't put all of your books in KDB Select, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you choose which ones you do? Well, so, you know, at this point, it's just, it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, I just know how, I, after seeing how people respond to the book, books wide versus, I mean, it's really just an experience thing. I mean, you can't, I don't, I, I, now when I, when I take on a new author, I put everyone in KU and I start out there. Um, mm -hmm. And for all the reasons that I said in the beginning, because I feel like if I'm going to put the marketing dollars into um, their books and um, then I want to make sure that I'm reaching the audience um, where they're buying books. So that is why I put everybody into KU. And occasionally, I find that that's not necessarily their audience. And so then we take mm -hmm. them wide and um, I incorporate other, um, you know, uh, I sort of shift the marketing focus at that point. Um, mm -hmm. But I pretty much start everyone in in Select, in KU, just because I feel like that is the, um, the best way to sort of gauge whether mm -hmm. that's their audience or not. Now, when you're in KDP Select, you have the option of doing some additional promotions like the, the free promotion or mm -hmm. the Kindle countdown deals. Do you do you use either of those? I do. I, I use um, I use uh, all of them. <laughs> I just do. these days I probably don't use the 99 cent um, uh, option very much. And, you know, I kind of have this sort of I I don't believe in. Um, how do I put this? I don't do um, low cost book releases because I feel like, um, you know, even without even without a discount, you know, my my hard my years worth of hard work costs the, the price of a cup of coffee. And I feel like that's worth it. Um, so I don't discount my new releases and I don't have a sort of um, discount happy philosophy. Um, but mm -hmm. I do feel, so I don't really like to do the, um, the 99 cent, um, the Kindle countdown deals, but I, I mean, I do do them. Um, but for me, it's more about getting, um, getting the volume of, if I do a free book, which I think mm -hmm. is extremely valuable, it's more about getting, um, a, uh, a, a, hu a huge volume of books out there and to get, um, uh, either bring in new new readers or to find out what the read through on a particular series is. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really gauge those kinds of things without having an, a large number of books moving. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're more likely to put do a free promotion on a backlist than a, a new release. Absolutely. There are books that there are books on, on my list that I've actually never really never discounted at all. I tend mm -hmm. to re, I tend to discount, um, you know, the uh, first book in a series. And I'll do that mm -hmm. often because I want to get, you know, a large volume of books out there. Like I said, right. you know, if I'm if I'm if if there are 30,000 downloads on um, the McKinnon's Bride, for example, then I can more mm -hmm. easily see how many of those 30,000 people went on to read um, book two and three and four. Um, mm -hmm. If you have uh, do a 99 cent book, and this is just me, it might work better for other people. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the, that's one of the things I really feel like I I have to say and emphasize is that no no one size fits all. You really have to try these things all for yourself because everybody's different. But to go back to my point, if I do a 99 cent um, uh, uh, promo and it a, a thousand books are downloaded. Well, it's mm -hmm. really difficult to gauge, you know, wh what the read through is on that because the numbers are going to be so small. So, right. so then it's difficult to see, um, you know, for example, which books I might want to actually put, uh, you know, higher dollar advertising into. Like I actually also mm -hmm. do the AMG ads 
um, than put with Amazon Marketing Group. And there are some ads I, I I almost will never do one of those without actually doing giving a free book away and seeing what the read through on the series looks like, because mm -hmm. you're just going. That's where you're going to make your money is on the page reads mm -hmm. on the series. So we've got a couple questions about starting out traditional and moving to indie publishing. Basically, you know, if you started a series with a traditional publisher uh, and there's no contract that says you have to continue the series with them, do you suggest sticking with the traditional publisher for the entire series and then starting a new series in indie publishing or, you know, halfway through moving the series over to indie publishing? I I don't see any reason at all why you have to stick with anything. <laughs> it's just I, it's something not working. I think that's one of the things I love about indie publishing is that it's mm -hmm. not this huge ship that can't turn. It can turn. You can turn. You're just a small publisher, and you can turn on a dime, and you can make changes. Like if I put a cut, I. I People ask me about my covers all the time, for example. I have changed, I don't even want to think about how much money I spent on covers, but the truth is that that is all part of the testing. Is I, I, I have probably spent over the course of the last, well, since 2012, I, I have probably spent $20,000 on covers. I mean, that's just the, that's, that's what I've done, you know, and, um, and I will change covers on a heartbeat. If it's just not working, I'm going to change it. You know, if I put something up and and I think it's, you know, going to reach, I think it's like just brilliant because I think this is like a, a new, a totally new concept that, you know, make that has gets all the feels of my book. And I mm -hmm. put it up and people just the, the and the and the you know the the buys drop. I'm like, okay, that that failed. <laughs> and I'm just right. I'm gonna move on and get an either put the other cover back on or or get a new one. So uh -huh. I do not believe you have to stick with anything at all. If you have a series that you love and you want to take that indie, you should take it indie. There are lots of ways to make it your own. Even if, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe in the beginning you attach it to the series um, just so that readers know that it's, it belongs to that series. And then mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, once you, you, your readership has found you again and understands, you know, then maybe rebrand it and, um, make it a spin-off series that you can actually promote in a more um in a more meaningful way. Mm -hmm. All right. So, we've got a few uh, questions about your publishing company. So, can you talk a little bit about that? So it's it's not a it's not the kind of publishing company that um, I mean like I don't take general submissions I actually have friends who um, a friend who uh, Catherine Levesque I'm going to give her a shout out here she's amazing and um, she has her own um, publishing house and it's just a, a force um, and she takes that new submissions so I don't do that I actually tend to work with authors that. Um, either come to me recommended or that I, you know, if I see an author that I feel like, um, uh, you know, they're maybe they're writing, still writing for trad or, and their backlist mm -hmm. isn't getting any love or whatever, you know, so I work with authors who are um, pretty much established authors who just aren't quite getting the foothold that they need in this business and who need a little mm -hmm. bit of extra, of extra help. And so I don't really take on new books, although I do publish mm -hmm. new books, um, I take on partners. I, t I like to think of it as a white glove partnership, if that makes sense. Definitely. And the focus, I love the fact that the, the focus is on that backlist and, and helping them make the most of it. Um, because to your Absolutely. point, you know, there, there are things happen and there are years where you're like, I'm not writing as much or I'm not publishing as much. So being able to, to utilize that effectively. I think is a great call out. Well, and that was, I think, the the impetus for the business and for the publishing house in the first place was that, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to keep my books relevant despite the fact that I'm this really slow writer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was able to keep my books relevant and I really wanted to do that for my author friends. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to empower them, you know, by empowering their, by, by strengthening, strengthening their backlist so that they can make the decisions for their front list that they need to make, whether that mm -hmm. is 
continue writing for trad or whether it's to go indie or whatever it is you know it's all about empowering my writers to make the decisions that are best for them and it's a partnership it's definitely mm -hmm. a partnership more than a publisher so, okay i think that's a that's a great distinction um being able to share your knowledge that you've built over the years with you know your friends and and colleagues you talked a little bit about you have three editing steps or, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? We've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, who your edit or, you know, how you edit your books and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about your editing process? Yeah. So I don't have like I know I have I have writer friends who have uh, uh, uh critique partners who share along the way. I don't do that. You know, if I, for whatever reason, I'm one of those writers that if I show anybody and like, I have to, I have to keep it to myself. I have to protect it. It's like this little bubble. And um, because, you know, if it gets any negative feedback, I might lose interest in it. If I talk about it too much, I might lose interest in it. You know, I just, I, I protect it. I protect my muse and the book during the time that I'm writing. So I don't share it with anyone during that time, but then, um, and I don't use an, a, a developmental editor anymore mm -hmm. because not even when, when I was with um, traditional publishing did they really do a lot of that for me. Like my books, mm -hmm. I mean, I, after 16 books, I know how, I know what I need and I know what I don't. Mm -hmm. So I, what I use first off is a, um, you know, a, a really good copy editor. And, um, and then I move to a line editor. And then sometimes they also need a proof. So. Okay. It depends on I'm 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 a I'm I'm a um I I'm forever tweaking like I will get it back from the very last um from from the line editor and then I'm you know I I see an entire paragraph that just needs re rewriting because I just didn't I don't like it and then I I tend to like change those and so when I send it off for the very last proof if I don't do that then I won't do the last proof but if I send mm -hmm. it off if I, if I do that I'll send it off for the last proof and I will make myself not touch it again which is not easy because <laughs> as artists you're always like pick 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 yeah it's definitely uh, true that on any given day for me anyway, on any given day, I'm both brilliant and I'm just total crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm terrible genius and I'm I'm just the exact opposite, depending <laughs> on my mood and depending, you know, because it could be the same exact passage that I'm reading. I'm going, oh, that's brilliant. And then tomorrow I'll just go, oh, God, what was I thinking? <laughs> So let's, um, we're almost at time, but I wanted to just follow up on that because some of our really new authors may not know the difference between a developmental editor, a copy editor, and a line editor. Can you talk about the differences between the three? So they're, they're probably, um, uh, so development, let's start with that because that's really easy. Mm -hmm. A developmental editor uh, really, you know, they will find the holes in your story, like, you know, things that you, um, you know, some things that don't quite make sense. Maybe your uh, pacing or timing was off and maybe um, your, uh, you know, just uh, your character is that your character's motives were not quite right or, you know, something's missing and a spark, maybe that spark um, uh, of romance between the characters is not quite, the chemistry is kind of not, not, not right. Um, mm -hmm. So the developmental developmental editor will help you with these things. They're there to mm -hmm. basically help you craft the story as well as it can be. A copy editor is that person who will, um, you know, check to make sure that they, you know, that they've used the word, um, um, you know, uh, what a word that you used in your manuscript that you know make sure that it didn't that it's not a modern word that you're you know, totally using completely out of, out of time. Um, mm -hmm. And they will, uh, you know, check, they do, a, a good copy editor will also check to make sure that you don't have any dangling mat modifiers and things like that. Whereas a line editor is strictly, there. It, it's kind of a cross between a copy editor and a, and a proofer, mm -hmm. you know, but I expect my line editors to mostly just proof. Okay. On that note, we're at time. That hour flew by. Thank you so much for joining us. This is so much great information. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And on that note, happy publishing, everyone. <laughs>